Okay, welcome everyone to this month's uh, EPIC seminar. We have a spectacular one today. Uh, just to introduce myself, yes. I'm Michael Greenstone. I'm the director of the Energy Policy Institute <coughs> in Chicago uh, and uh, the Milton Friedman Professor of uh, Economics. So today, uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, pipelines uh, and power lines, the future of US energy infrastructure and the implications uh, for clean energy. And I think the reason it's such a good topic uh, for uh, to be held at the University of Chicago and EPIC is that a lot of energy and environment, uh, it's a big umbrella and lots of people find their way underneath that umbrella. And I think uh, some people get under there because they're very focused on energy access or energy security or inexpensive energy. Uh, other people are very focused on climate change uh, and maybe a third set are very focused on kind of local pollutants or in local environmental problems. And the a thesis of what we do and our view of how to think about the energy system is that uh, it is not uh, correct to think about it as any of those three things in isolation. It's not a climate problem. It's not an energy security problem. It's not a pollution problem. Uh, but rather, it's a problem that has all three of those elements at once. Uh, and uh, what part of what is so uh, exciting and interesting <coughs> about uh, the energy problem is that it's hard to think about because you have these goals, some of which are in conflict with each other. and. How do societies find ways uh, to balance their various goals related to energy, uh, inexpensive and reliable energy, climate, uh, and uh, environmental pollution problems? And a lot of that runs through uh, infrastructure. Uh, so I took the liberty to use Google today. Uh, so I'm sure they found all kinds of information about me in the process. But one of the things they found out is that I like the California ISO page. Uh, and where I was wondering, well, you know, what are uh, local uh, LMPs or local marginal prices for a megawatt of electricity in uh, California? And are, are there, is there big variability? And uh, I saw the most amazing thing in the middle of the afternoon when there's lots of sun uh, in the Central Valley at one of the nodes, uh, the price to produce, uh, uh, the price uh, for a megawatt of electricity was minus $15. That is, people had to pay $15 to produce. Uh, so for everyone on the panel and many people in the room, that's understand right away, that's because all the solar that was uh, being deployed and uh, production tax credits and things like that. And yet, just to my mind, it lo will look like about 50 miles on the map, certainly over the hill out of the Central Valley towards LA, uh, it was 230 megawatt, uh, $230 per megawatt hour. Uh, quite a difference. Uh, you would think that that's something that infrastructure uh, might be able to do something about. Uh, and it's also obvious, uh, since it's solar that was uh, producing the electricity in the Central Valley, uh, that there, and probably a mix uh, on, on the other side of the hill, uh, that there are clear implications from those price differences. And if you were to equalize them, uh, what would happen with respect to climate and CO2 emissions, and what would happen uh, to local environmental pollutants? Uh, and so it's why we have such a bang up group here, which I will introduce in a minute. Uh, but these problems cannot be thought of by themselves, but rather they're all interlinked. Uh, so we have a, just a terrific group to talk uh, about these issues today. Uh, and we're gonna start uh, with Terry Donnelly, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at ComEd, uh, which provides electricity here uh, in Northern Illinois. So I looked up what uh, Terry's responsibilities were, uh, and so he'll be meeting people outside the room at the end of this because they include uh, performance and engineering, safety, service reliability, customer satisfaction, financial management, and smart grid de uh, development for all of Northern Illinois, practically. Uh, so Terry's a busy man. Uh, he will be taking your complaints later. <laughs> it's our job. <laughs> Uh, and now Terry's going to give us uh, some, uh, we're fortunate to have Terry give us some opening remarks, and then I'll come back and uh, introduce our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Greenstone, and for that kind introduction. I consider myself the uh, chief cook and bottle washer. Um, and it's great to be here at the University of Chicago 
Uh, I did not go here. I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia a number of years ago, which I won't reveal. Uh, and yes, I am an Eagles fan. So for those of so sorry. And it's, um, thank you, Epic and uh, Sam Ori, for including me uh, in the conversation today. Uh, good evening and welcome, everyone. Uh, and thank you for your interest in the critical issues of the nation's electric infrastructure and the need to ensure safe, reliable, resilient, and clean energy for everyone. It's fashionable for businesses today uh, to say that their industries are being disrupted by innovators, by new entrants, by market shifts. And for many industries, this is true. Netflix for the entertainment business, Airbnb for the hospitality industry, Amazon for retail. And the list goes on and on and on. Most of what people expect from their energy for somewhat has not changed for a long time. They expect the lights to stay on all the time. I know this to be true, that they expect that to remain on all the time. So that is a universal truth that's uh, endured through the decades. They expect energy to be, del be delivered uh, where they need it and they expect it to be produced and delivered safely uh, and provided at a reasonable cost. But these expectations of the past are now, now becoming sort of the cost of entry or the minimum requirement, and energy companies that wish to stay relevant will, of course, need to adapt. Residences, businesses, and public institutions are alike are starting to demand more from their energy, and some of the barriers to entry we're a heavily regulated industry, uh, are starting to come down. That means the energy sector is ripe for disruption too. What we utility companies used to call rate payers and now refer to as customers, increasingly are being thought of as consumers. They want more choice and greater convenience, more access and secure access to information and emerging technologies that will help them make smarter energy decisions. And increasingly, they want energy that is clean, resilient, new word coming into the, to the definition, resiliency, uh, and perhaps ultra, ultra reliable. In short, they want their experience with energy to be as simple as grabbing an Uber and as customized as choosing a series to binge watch at home, but maybe a little more complicated than that. And this shift is happening. It's driven by growing demand for technologies, right? Technologies that you're all talking about. Distributed energy, especially solar, certainly wind. Large scale battery storage to smooth the delivery of energy from intermittent uh, renewable sources. Electric vehicles, smart devices, and smart homes, microgrids and other smart city innovations that will bolster resilience, there's that resilience word again, and allow for two-way flow of data. In the regulated utility industry, transmission, and we talked, intro that a little bit uh, in the beginning, the network of you know, that heavy duty, that stuff on the big towers, uh, power lines that connect whole regions uh, together could play a role, or will play a role, in the transition to a more consumer energy-driven future. America's transmission infrastructure is aging. It requires both maintenance and modernization to ensure our electricity supply remains reliable, resilient, responsive, and cost-effective. And while the cost of renewables continue to fall, they are constrained by insufficient transmission at times. You still have to get from here to there. The global issue, uh, the nation needs uh, more long distance power lines if we want to move energy efficiently from the places where solar and wind are plentiful to centers of demand. This global issue is also local, and as the owner and operator of transmission lines in, in this region, we have managed to make some progress uh, on this front. Last spring, for instance, ComEd completed a new 60 mile 
345,000 volt transmission line, overhead line, uh, across four uh, northern Illinois uh, counties. Not without challenges. The project alleviated congestion on the electric grid, allowing more lower cost electricity to flow to population and commercial centers where customers need it. Importantly, this freed wind power from more remote regions west of here, satisfying customers' hunger for cleaner but affordable energy. We call that project the Grand Prairie Gateway. The project is expected to pro provide customers more than $250 million in savings, net of all cost, and reduce carbon emissions by about 400,000 tons over the first 15 years from an independent study that's filed with the uh, commission. So that was really, uh, you know, actually built and, and put in service uh, last April, which we're pretty proud of. And in another even closer example, uh, ComEd converted the city of Chicago's transmission system to a network model from what we might call hub and spoke to like sort of an interstate highway model. We connected new substations to one another with uh, 138,000 volt lines and added multiple 345,000 volt, yes, underground, transmission, which uh, that is a significant challenge in downtown Chicago, underground transmission lines and added a new substation uh, in the West Loop for more resiliency and more reliability uh, to the whole metro area. This reliability and economic benefits are just a couple of the compelling reasons for our nation to invest more in transmission. But as good as projects like these are for customers and for the utility itself, there are still significant challenges to new investment and development of long distance uh, lines across the country. In most regions, electricity demand has consistently declined, not all regions, or at best flat through, due to a variety of reasons. Siting and permitting can remain lengthy and cumbersome process and technology. We hear many, many times, everybody wants lines that are under the ground. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, technology uh, and cost, not quite up to the challenge yet to deliver that kind of product always underground over those kinds of distances. And coordinating across jurisdictions, as I'm sure our panelists know, would, it can be difficult. And maybe that's an understatement, especially when it comes to determine who will benefit uh, from these benefits and who will bear the cost. These challenges are heightened by the uncertainty around distributed generation. We don't know how quickly distributed generation will expand in a given market. We've seen it expand in different areas of the country. And transmission investments in, uh, depreciate over a long horizon, 30 to 40 years. A surge in customer-owned generation like solar combined with already declining demand or flat demand could reduce the need for a new line and the value of existing ones. This makes it difficult in our regulated model to predict whether investments in transmission will retain their value for tomorrow. The result, transmission development, has been relatively low in our country in recent decades, albeit some large jobs uh, in specific areas uh, certainly have been built. This can present challenges to consumer-facing utilities you know, like us here at ComEd. It can make it harder to plan and to know how to allocate our investments. And it can make it harder to connect consumers to the lower cost or cleaner energy resources that they may want. And it can make it harder to ensure the reliability, resilience, and security of aging transmission systems. But that does not change the simple truth that incumbent energy companies certainly need to achieve these goals. And we need to innovate and collaborate with others and adapt our business models or risk being disrupted. Because energy consumer, consumerism will advance, and because scores of entrepreneurs and big tech companies are rushing to solve problems energy consumers haven't perhaps even imagined yet. In the absence of meaningful progress, some regional electric utilities are getting creative. And to bring it back locally, here, ComEd for one imagines a much more dynamic future for energy, one that consumers will have much greater control, where innovations and new market entrants will offer businesses and residents access 
to energy and services, how they want them, when they want them, uh, products ranging from energy supply and management devices, community solar, uh, electric vehicle charging, and data products. Where consumers will have greater choice, access to more clean energy options, smarter ways to conserve, and simple customized experience. And where many transactions, direct and indirect, will take place across the, the grid with terabytes of value flowing among many parties in, in actually near real time. The vision for the future requires us to evolve the grid as we've known it into an enabling platform for all these other partners and market entrants. And the first critical step is to make the grid smart. It's been used a lot. You know, what is that? Uh, thanks to the enactment of the Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act in Illinois in 2011, right here, we've managed to do that, hardening and modernizing the grid for more than 4 million customers. We have 4 million customers uh, across the metro area. And over five years, we've replaced and renewed lots of cable and poles and wires and substations uh, many times over, installed more than 2,600 smart switches, uh, to automate power flows and restore power automatically and not require a troubleshooter to fight their way through streets, snow and ice to restore power. And we've installed three and a half million, we're not quite done yet, um, smart meters with the last of our customers scheduled to receive smart meters this year. And together these smart meters and switches, for example, allow us to ping locations remotely to detect outages where we never could do that before. This reduces crews, the number of crews we must dispatch and allows them to focus on proactive work where they can even further improve the grid. These investments have helped us avoid millions of outages since 2012, and we've improved reliability by 50% in five years, and we hope that reliability will continue through the event tonight here. Um, we connected customers with digital tools and allowed them to track and reduce energy and improve customer satisfaction as the most improved uh, customer uh, utility in the JD Power score for the fifth consecutive year. And we were also gratified that this work has helped Illinois, right, state of Illinois, earn second place ranking for grid modernization among all states in the country from the GridWise Alliance and Smart Grid Policy Center. That's pretty significant. We think California, actually California's first, uh, and Illinois second. I think a lot of people don't really know that. So anticipating these market shifts, some local electric utilities have managed to provide safer, more reliable, more resilient power at a reasonable cost. At the same time and against the backdrop of limited transmission development, we've laid the groundwork for that platform for energy technologies and services, those features that customers all want. So what's next? Well, imagine smart cities where LED street lights dim and brighten on command. Yes, street lights, they sound, maybe they sound boring, but they are the hallmark of a quality of life in sort of a highly populated uh, uh, neighborhood. And we're making them smart, we're making them intelligent. Where inductors in our highways charge electric cars as they speed across the future, and that may be a little ways off, or expanded use of hydrogen. We see that across the globe with folks working on that. Within those cities, picture smart homes where centralized batteries dole out excess power at night generated by solar panels during the day and where major appliances turn themselves on and off, where Alexa pays your utility bill uh, and gives you personalized advice for lowering it. You know, we actually made a video on that one. That's a good one. Um, the details are still coming into focus, but this is not a question of it, but, but when uh, innovations like this will usher in a new era of energy management. We and uh, like-minded utilities, uh, we all want to be a catalyst uh, for an engaged participant in this transformation. Don't want to be an obstacle, we want to be a catalyst. We want to make it seamless and it's a mindset uh, among uh, companies, uh, certain companies like ours. Three miles, three miles north of here, uh, in the Bronzeville neighborhood, we're experimenting. It's very exciting. Uh, there, we're investing in the community of the future, a connected, green, and resilient neighborhood 
that will serve as a template for others. We're very excited about that. We're leading pilot projects such as electric vehicle mobility, community energy storage, and soon, we hope, with approvals very soon, a microgrid. It's all an effort to test energy consumption requirements and better understand customer preferences for the smart cities of the future. And at the same time, courtesy of the Future Energy Jobs Act, that Illinois enacted last year, again, that, you know, these kinds of policies that drive that sort of ranking uh, uh, for the state of Illinois. Uh, we're driving uh, clean energy progress in the state through initiatives that will significantly expand energy efficiency programs for residences, build, uh, businesses, and the public sector. Unleash new investments in large-scale rooftop and community solar, especially maybe community solar here in Illinois in our territory, as well as new wind power. And actually train and develop the clean energy workforce of the future, which is a big part of the legislation. And I'm hopeful that those of you here, energy thought leaders for today and tomorrow, uh, share our optimism for the nation's energy future and our vision for a more empowered and enlightened lightened consumer. I, for one, can't wait to see it materialize, and I appreciate your time and attention, and I look forward to the panel discussion here tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Terry, and uh, we look forward to continue to develop a strong relationship between ComEd uh, and uh, the EPIC. So now we'll turn to the panel here and just moving straight down. Uh, first, we have uh, John Wellinghoff, who's a former chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, he's the longest serving head of FERC, uh, known for his thought leadership in energy policy, uh, electric markets, uh, and I might even better say maybe the grid of the future. He's probably done a lot of thinking about that, and hopefully we'll have a chance to hear about that. Uh, next is Alan Four, who's the VP of Public Affairs for Kinder Morgan. Uh, they're one of the largest energy infrastructure companies in North America. Uh, I looked up this afternoon. Uh, part of the, I will say, part of the appeal of, for the <laughs> academics uh, of having this event is just kind of like thinking about like big pipes and steel and stuff like that. And Kinder Morgan has uh, 85,000 miles of pipeline, I think that's right. Uh, and so just think about that. The US is only 3,000 miles across. Uh, and next is Ed Kraples, who's the CEO of an independent transmission company, and Bark Development Partners. Uh, Ed has a long and distinguished career in the energy industry. Uh, he, we like to, with pride, remind him that uh, he is a Chicago grad, and we're happy to have him in our ranks, uh, and uh, is a real leader in the energy industry. And finally, we have uh, Steve Sakala, who is an assistant professor at the Harris School, who uh, has been visiting Harvard this year on his leave of uh, an annual leave. But when we mentioned we were thinking of this event, Steve said that he would walk from Cambridge if he had to. Uh, and uh, Steve is one of the people who, when you talk about big pipes and power lines and things like that, uh, gets very excited. So let me turn it over <laughs> to the panel. He also has good economic ideas, too, in between uh, talking about that. But he does like lots of big infrastructure. So thank you. All right, thank you, Michael, for that generous introduction. Um, so I wanted to start off uh, at a somewhat higher level, and then we'll drill down into, into particulars. First, uh, with uh, Ed and Alan, if you could uh, sort of describe to us um, sort of what you and your, your companies do, what role uh, do you play in the US energy sector? Um, and Barrick's kind of a professional disruptor. Uh, we uh, started the company because FERC, whom we look at as a god in our universe, said it was okay for independent companies to try to develop transmission lines. So FERC has been a very uh, steadfast proponent of competition in the sector, and so over the last uh, 20 years, 
We uh, are one of the few companies that's actually been able to build two interregional transmission lines. One is called Neptune uh, 660 megawatt HVDC line. I think in this audience, I don't need to say what that is. Um, from New Jersey to uh, under Jones Beach, um, all the way to the middle of Long Island, it's about 80 miles. Imagine connecting New Jersey and New York electrically, right? Uh, the second project is called Hudson, and it connects New Jersey to Manhattan uh, at West 49th Street. Uh, those projects for the independent sector of transmission are kind of iconic representations of what could happen. Uh, but interestingly, very little of this has actually happened. Uh, those of you who follow this industry know that there have actually been very, very few interregional transmission projects built. And if we have time to go into it, I'd be glad to, to talk about that. On the other hand, because I was so concerned about the difficulty of building transmission, my company also develops microgrids. And so, as Terry said, uh, microgrids kind of a hot new word. I'm going to marry it up, Terry, with another hot new word, blockchain. And so what we're now seeing is, I think, really a revolutionary uh, change in the organization of consumers. Uh, micro transactions that will be taking place in most places. And as the years go by, I think this will become uh, an enormously important part of how we transact energy with one another. The more that happens, I think the less new transmission we need, because the existing grid is actually a pretty good machine. So we'll need to build some new transmission lines for renewable energy, like offshore wind. We'll need to fix what's broken, repair and replace the old grid. But to me, that marriage of transmission lines and microgrids is kind of where the future is. So uh, Kinder Morgan, is, as mentioned in the introduction, um, is known as a midstream company. What, is, what does midstream mean? Well, really it's transportation and storage. Uh, we have 80,000 miles of pipeline, over 150 terminals. We transport CO2, refined products, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, uh, natural gas, um, crude oil. And we ba do that based upon the needs of our customers. So if someone wants to move product from point A to point B, we provide a mechanism to do that. So in addition to the pipelines, we also have tankers, uh, Jones Act tankers, uh, that serve uh, domestic seaports. Um, so collectively, uh, our, our systems, if you put an a our asset map on the United States, we're covering most of the shale plays in the country. So if you need to move a product, uh, it's a good bet on one of our systems, you can move that product from one place to another. Now, obviously there are lots of interconnect with other companies, and we talk about our 85,000 miles of pipeline as an industry leader in this. There are over two million miles of pipelines uh, of various shapes and sizes, uh, but um, the interconnection of those pipelines and how they work together and how companies work together, I think is part of how we're going to manage our transportation and storage moving forward. Um, one of the things we look at, and I know tonight is talking about the future and, and how pipelines and, and the transportation is going to play in all of this. When we're looking at uh, how we're going to service customers in the future, what, what are the issues and concerns that we're looking at? Uh, the dynamics have really changed over the last several years, and I know uh, the chairman will, will attest to the, 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 the changing nature of the industry since Keystone. Whoever thought that a pipeline would be part of a national political debate? Um, this ne never really happened before to that extent. And since that's happened, all companies that are either operating or expanding their infrastructure have a new, I think, an important sensitivity to a wide variety of factors beyond just the commercial uh, and industry interest. Uh, the public <coughs> interest is unprecedented. I was speaking before uh, we started the panel tonight about a project we had in the Northeast. Uh, 
that we ended up not pursuing for a variety of reasons, but where we had over 100 town hall meetings related to that project. And if you want to go to a town hall, you do it in New England, right? Yeah, you live free, to my live, town, live free right? or die, and I'm not kidding, in New Hampshire. Um, <laughs> take it very seriously, but, but that's kind of what we're seeing across the country is um, as, you know, the company who, uh, we're very much interested in growing, very much interested in making sure that our footprint, as well as others in the industry, can deal with this energy renaissance that has completely changed the framework of how we transport energy in the country and, and leading us to talk about exporting energy, how, how we can best serve by building new assets or repurposing existing assets to meet that need. We've got billions of projects uh, uh, that are in development or a backlog as we call it, another word in the industry, a backlog of projects. Uh, but I know we're going to talk about this moving forward, but I think it's very important at the outset to understand, uh, and, and certainly from a FERC perspective, but from a broader perspective of the incredible role that all units of government play in having a part in the siting and expansion and operation of our infrastructure moving forward. Great. Uh, speaking of the, the role of government, John, could you tell us a little bit of contrasting transmission lines and, and pipelines? What's the role of FERC? Sure, I'd be happy to do so. Although, first I want to say to Terry, actually, I was in a panel like this once where the lights did go out. It, <laughs> it was actually at MIT, so I appreci appreciate the uh, confidence you've got in your upgraded system here, Terry. I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion here without having it interrupted by the lights going out, but it did, it did happen to me once. Um, it, there's an, an interesting and actually bizarre contrast between um, interstate pipelines and interstate transmission and FERC's jurisdiction and authority over the two. One is under the Federal Power Act, the other is under the Natural Gas Act. Um, with respect to the, the permitting and siting uh, authority of an interstate pipeline, uh, FERC has plenary authority over that activity. So, you know, whenever Kinder Morgan's going to uh, build a pipeline, they've got to come to FERC and they've got to get a permit and a uh, certificate from FERC to do that. And, and FERC really is there every stage of the way. Uh, overseeing that, that entire process and acting as the coordinator between all of the agencies that may have some interest in the pipeline, the environmental issues and others. And FERC really shepherds that through in a very effective way. And that's why we have uh, how many millions of pipelines? Uh, over two. Two, two million. Two point one million. So we have yeah. over two million uh, uh, miles of pipeline in this country and, and effectively uh, can deliver <coughs> natural gas anywhere. Uh, and that authority was was given to FERC uh, back in the, I guess, late 30s when the Natural Gas Act was put in place, primarily because we had a development of gas in this country in a place called the Permian Basin um, that was remote from most of the places where they were going to use the gas. So you had this have some way to move the gas from where we were producing it, you know, in the uh, fields in Oklahoma and Texas to the northeast and to the west and to areas where people could use the gas. So you had to have a federal agency who had the authority to do that. So they were given that authority. Transmission lines are completely different. FERC has absolutely no siting authority whatsoever over an interstate transmission line. We have, we, we I always <laughs> fall back to we, I'm not a FERC anymore, but, but FERC has authority, of course, to uh, decide who gets to interconnect into a transmission line. FERC has authority over planning those interstate transmission lines. FERC has authority over cost allocation with respect to those interstate transmission lines, but no authority with respect to actually permitting and siting a transmission line, with the exception of a line that is um, adjacent to and uh, pertinent to and necessary for the interconnection of a hydro system that FERC does have authority over. So we, we can, can uh, have siting authority with respect to that, that, that line from, from a hydro dam to the, the main 
transmission line, in essence. So there's no siting authority. So who has the siting authority? The siting authority and permitting authority for transmission lines in this country is with the states. And the states uh, oftentimes uh, even delegate that down to the county level to some, uh, in some instances. So you have this dichotomy between getting per permits and getting authority to actually build, site and build a pipeline versus siting and building a transmission line. And it is a much, much more onerous process for someone to go through the process of actually having a transmission line sited because of that, because they have to go through each state and each state agency uh, and, has, and there's not necessarily any coordination. Plus, not only that, but they then have to deal with all the federal agencies that may be involved as well, in addition, if, they go, if they're going across or adjacent to uh, federal enclaves, DOD or a Bureau of Land Management or other federal entities as well. So they have you know, all that to deal with where the pipelines really have sort of the pretty much one-stop shop is FERC. And FERC, yes, yes, they have to worry about uh, other federal, uh, federal uh, enclaves that they're going through, if they're going over BLM land or whatever, but FERC will be there to oversee that process to ensure that it actually gets done. That doesn't hap happen with the transmission line. Great. So that leads us really nicely into the, my next question for, for Ed and Alan. Could you walk us through, I don't know that there's a typical process, but say you want to build a line or, or a pipeline. What, what would you normally expect from that process? How does it work? Well, it, because we're an independent company, we get to build the transmission lines we want, as opposed to a utility like Terry's who has to build the transmission lines that are needed <clears throat> to keep the lights on. So I want to make a big distinction between reliability projects, which by and large the utilities in this country still mostly do, and what you might call elective projects. And elective projects are the ones that we focus on. And if you're very careful, and if you remember that you're not a utility and therefore don't have eminent domain within the state, you can get them done. Uh, we have built uh, two projects and we have uh, developed three more where we had no public opposition to our projects, none. Even though in the development process we actually have to put money in an account for interveners to spend against us. Even with that, we have not had interveners against us. And I think it's because uh, we, we, we are a truly humble group of people. We really are. It, it, we know how difficult it is. <laughs> no, it, if you say it, I know you're not, but, but, but honestly, it makes a difference. So if you look at projects that have gone badly wrong, uh, for example, the Northern Pass Project <clears throat> in New England, they spent $250 million on developing a project and the state of New Hampshire siting committee just said no. Astounding, absolutely incredible. And part of the challenge of developing what you might call electric transmission lines is just picking the place where you want to try to do it and being wise about places that you should avoid. Uh, building a transmission, overhead transmission line down the spine of New Hampshire it's a really bad idea and would never, I would never have contemplated that. I would never have spent my investors' money doing that. So um, we do cheat a bit. We do underground transmission where we can, uh, and that makes all the difference. We do DC transmission where we can, and that also makes a big difference because uh, the lack of EMF and those kinds of scary things that people don't like. and. When we do an elective project, we try to do renewables-oriented elective projects because those are the ones that there's a need for. And so our next, uh, our next challenge is to try to be the transmission developer for offshore wind. It's immensely complicated. When you put New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts together, it's 8,000 megawatts, John, right? That is not, you do not want to do that in onesies, twosies. You want to plan that out. And interestingly, we do not have a transmission planning organization in the federal government, nor do we have them really in the state government. So little companies like mine get to 
go through the process, ask FERC for permissions and authorities, go through the BOEM process, the Bureau of Offshore Energy, um, and go to each state and literally develop the damn thing and force ourselves into the network. And that's what independent transmission companies do. How does that contrast with sort of a regular transmission company? So well, where, where do $250 million <coughs> go if a uh, you know, piece of metal never goes on the ground? That, that typically, and, and I don't want to speak for Terry, but, but I, I would think that Terry's business, there is a... a sorry, for transmi uh, electricity transmission. Right, yeah, uh, sorry. but, yep. but in, in uh, a regulated company, yep. there's usually a process for determining what has to be built for, for reliability purposes. And I'd say that's 95% of what utilities do. Uh, they've only recently begun to go into elective transmission projects, and they have as much trouble there as, as the rest of us do. Great. Um, so to look at project, when we look at a, a building a project, um, let me just walk through a few of the, the basic steps. Yep. Um, you have to have a commercially viable project. In other words, you have to have in our business uh, a company that is willing to commit to long-term commercial shipping contracts that are creditworthy. And that's tougher and tougher to do these days when you're talking about going out 10 to 15 to 20 years asking a company to commit to a firm volume on that pipeline for that number of years. <coughs> I think any of us in the panel would agree, if we can forecast what the energy environment is going to be 20 years from now, <laughs> I don't think anyone can. Uh, who would have thought, you know, go back 20 years and look where we are today. So that's tough. That's tough to get, yeah, but you have to pass that threshold or everything else is meaningless. Um, and then you look at the basics of, of construction of a pipeline. You have to have a route. You have to site the pipeline. And to add on what, what John was mentioning about FERC, FERC re regulates interstate natural gas pipelines for siting. They don't regulate interstate products pipelines for siting purposes. So much like the electric, trans electric transmission, that goes to the states. So if you're looking at a multi-state products pipeline, that means if you're talking about an oil pipeline, a gasoline, diesel pipeline, those are individual state requirements. You've got to <laughs> build a pipeline that can meet and exceed the regulatory environment in each and every one of those jurisdictions at the state and sometimes the local level. Uh, if you can't pass that, no project. Um, and then you've got to find a way to construct that project on a schedule that's going to meet those other needs. So oftentimes we are talking about a project that is going to spend two to three years in the planning and permitting phases and six months in the construction phase. Um, so you've got to plan out that far ahead. And I will tell you, I was asked one time at a FERC scoping meeting about how many projects we have had before FERC, before the commissioners. There's a multi-step process in the FERC approval process. How many projects have we had that FERC has rejected? Because once it gets to the commissioners, it has a staff recommendation to move forward. And we, I, uh, to my knowledge, we have not had any. Yeah. But how many projects never make it yeah. to the point of even applying for a FERC application? Hundreds. Multiple ones right as we speak today are not going to make that threshold because they can't meet those uh, various um, uh, steps along the way. So I think that's important to note the risk-averse companies, and we're certainly a risk-averse company, um, the chilling effect that I think the, the uncertainty that is out there, not so much from a FERC level. Uh, FERC is, um, I think, been a pretty steady place to do business, both from an industry level, I think fairly from a, a consumer level, from a public level, uh, and, as, and as adapted as the various changes have come along in the energy landscape. The states, though, are much more uncertain. And the states are playing a much more active role in even FERC-regulated projects. And I'm sure John can expand upon that. But what projects aren't <laughs> making it past that initial uh, company determination of whether we're even going to try? And what does that do to the overall collective transportation system, whether it's pipelines, power lines, rail, ship, whatever, truck? 
Um, because you need components of all of those. And if you don't, if, if one is not able to make it past that threshold, one is jeopardized, whether it's New England that has uh, a serious shortage of natural gas capacity, or other parts of the country where natural gas is becoming more part of power generation. You have to get it there. And the ways to do that are limited. And so I think as, as we're looking at uh, the, the future is um, trying to uh, work as best we can, whether it's industry best practices or otherwise, to find ways that the regulators can uh, understand uh, better about that serious component, because I don't, we don't hear much about that, the projects that never make it past the drawing board. But I will tell you, in an unprecedented way, they just aren't getting there because uh, the risk is too great. Uh, one other thing to add, too, that, that we're seeing in construction and whether we decide to build projects is, is you know, there, there, in the past there's been a lot of mega projects. And what I mean by mega, you remember our Rockies Express pipeline oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that went across eight states. You have the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline. You have the Keystone Pipeline. You have, right. So you have a lot of these big, big projects, which are probably the riskiest of all because there's so many multiple components to them. I think what we're seeing in a lot of our projects now are more incremental projects. And what I mean by that is rather than build a new greenfield pipeline, you build an additional compressor station. You retrofit or, or enhance a compressor station. You build new pump stations on your products pipelines. You have looping projects. That's, a, that's another pipeline right next to an existing pipeline where you can stay within the existing right-of-way. It lessens the environmental uh, uh, impacts and regulatory approvals. Um, so you, and, and you try to, that's a, a, a less risk-averse process, but it's also easier to explain what you're doing too. What, you know, people are asking more these days when they say, you know, all these pipes out there, why do you need more? Uh, fair question. You can't just say simply somebody wants to move product from here to here anymore. Not maybe in a certain regulatory environment that still works, but not out there. Isn't that, that's where I am, out there a lot, uh, explaining to folks. But if you could say for a utility, we're doing this so that X customer can provide additional natural gas. This is what we're doing in Massachusetts right now on a project we're working on. Um, we're explaining exactly what that is going to be used for. And I think that project is much more likely to have less opposition if people can fully understand. So that's a good development, but let's not miss the, the challenges that that brings about on what is not going to be brought to bear uh, and the versatility and a uh, wider array of choices that we have for transportation and store of our, uh, storage of our energy because of those uh, limitations and adversity to risk. Great. Uh, John, I, I thought you put it well when you described historically uh, why FERC plays the role that it does for natural gas pipelines, that it was all in one place and they needed to get it to all these places. Right. And I guess to a certain extent, once they got it to all of these places, that sort of created the room for the states taking the primary role in the electric grid because they already had the means of getting the fuel there. So I wanted to ask you what happens when our renewable energy sources and their spatial distribution starts looking more like the distribution of, of classical fuels, where it's only in a few places where you have really good wind or really good sun, and you can't put that in a pipeline or on a rail line. Does that sort of motivate an increased role for the federal government there? Well, you know, I thought it did at one time. Um, I had that view back in 2006, 2007, when I first join FERC, if you looked at the country and you looked at the resource maps that NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, comes up with of wind and solar, you can look at this, you know, amazing band of wind from the Dakotas all the way down through Oklahoma and Texas that could, in essence, power the entire country, but, you know, most of the population lives within, what, 300 miles of the coast. So, if you, you know, you let's build some transmission lines from all this wind out to yep. into the east and, out, and the west. And similarly, you look at the <coughs> solar resource, uh, you know, from the state that, that I grew up in and, and spent most of my life in Nevada, 
and, and Arizona in the southwest, the huge solar resource there, but again, trying to you know, move it to those areas. But I think that's um, diminished some because of the efficiencies in, and improvements <coughs> in technology in both solar and wind. You're seeing now the ability to put, you know, I, I've got a client who puts up uh, huge utility scale wind turbines next to industrial sites because those industrial customers want to have that wind turbine there in part for, you know, uh, their PR perspective, but also it turns out it's economical to do so in places like Ohio that are not necessarily the best uh, wind resource, but yet the turbine technology has advanced so much that it is cost effective to do that. Similarly, and I, I've got clients now in Alberta, you know, who are thinking of putting in solar and because you you look look at the um, at the latitudes. It turns out Calgary is at the same latitude as Berlin. Well, Germany has huge amounts of solar, and it's you know primarily because you know the technologies have advanced to the point where <coughs> ultimately uh, wind and solar are not necessarily uh, cost effective simply uh, in those areas where the resource is the most uh, intense. However, you know obviously from a from an economic standpoint, it would seem to make some sense to put in transmission in those uh, high wind regimes and those high solar regimes to move it to other locations. But you have this offsetting um, tension and uh, difficulty. And, uh, you know, we can talk about that some of the people who've tried to take uh, lines and move them from o just from Oklahoma to TVA or, you know, as uh, Michael Skelly, a person Ed and I know, know very well, you know, the clean line projects, and I remember him coming in to me at FERC in uh, 2007, 2008 with this grand idea of, to do exactly that, to move this wind from these huge wind re regimes in the Midwest to areas where the, the loads were, and uh, those lines still aren't built. Would that project have worked if it was a pipeline? Yes. If it was a pipeline, it would have gotten built, I think. <laughs> no question it would have got built if it was a pipeline, but because it was a transmission line, you know, it's been state by state and, you know, battle by battle, and, and they haven't, haven't made it. So what you described was the, the level of costs in these areas without very high quality wind or, or sun is getting lower. Yes. What about the difference in resources? It's still prime wind territory in Iowa. Is the difference yes. between the quality of wind in Iowa just the same as it used to yeah, be between yeah, Iowa yeah, yeah, and the quality of wind in, in Iowa versus or in, or in Montana or in the Dakotas versus Ohio uh, is still uh, the same, but the, the turbine technology is so advanced and it's becoming more efficient and, and, and less costly to put these turbines in um, that it makes sense that you can put it in these lower wind regimes and still make money. There, there's also a, a state-centric approach to renewable energy development that I think is very, very important. The states look at renewable energy as economic development mm -hmm. plays and for New England and for New York, importing renewable energy from abroad, even if <laughs> abroad is a couple of states over, is simply not politically popular or even feasible. Right. So New York would rather develop offshore wind, which it has and is about to start, than importing uh, wind from the Midwest. So for me right now, the Midwest play for, for wind, great wind, but it is not going to go much further than one or two states over. Yeah, if you, if you looked at, and I, I remember running the numbers, if you looked at the numbers of what the, it would cost to generate wind in the Midwest and build a transmission line to New England to deliver it, it was significantly cheaper than any cost of developing offshore wind off of New England or New York and delivering that out there. The difference, John, just that the technology improvement that you're talking about has happened offshore as right, well. Right, that's true, and, it, what and is that, so, that wasn't there at the time. Yeah, what's so dramatic is that now in Europe, we actually have, uh, because the transmission has been built offshore, uh, so there is an offshore grid. You now have uh, no subsidy auctions, and wind developers are actually mm -hmm. bidding no subsidy wind <coughs> machines. 
and farms for Europe, that means that the price is in the $70, $80 per megawatt hour range. Well, that's competitive. Yeah. Um, so as long as you can take care of the transmission cost, uh, offshore wind has arrived. And that means for the East Coast that rather than bring it in from Oklahoma, just develop it on your own coast. Mm -hmm. So continuing along the idea of, of contrasting your, your two industries and getting into exactly these local and state issues, uh, I, I thought it'd be good if you spend a minute talking about your role both with participants upstream and downstream from you. To what extent are they your, your suppliers and your customers versus your competitors? So I guess uh, first I, to start, Ed, for example, there okay. are incumbent utilities. When you build a transmission line, you're bringing someone else's power to that area. It is, uh, thanks to, to John and, and the commission, um, since FERC Order 1000 was issued, uh, transmission is a competitive business. So a company like mine, we have a very large, now a very large uh, Canadian pension fund as our <coughs> primary investor. I think our cost of money is super competitive. Um, so we get to compete, and that is a wonderful thing, and I think it is beginning to change the behavior of established transmission companies as well. So in New England, there is an uh, ultra-competitive transmission sector that has evolved, um, and so we see these renewable mandates as our customer, de facto, right? They're, they're, they're uh, long-term contracts that transmission has to be a part of. And the competitors are the other utilities, but not just other utilities, but also other independent transmission developers. So it's become a really thriving and competitive business. I think very similar to yours. It's very competitive to be a gas pipeline developer. It, it is, and you know, we're, we're, we're consistently looking at a, a new ways to um, make our pipeline systems uh, more commercially viable in a, in a really competitive environment. Um, and I, I think that um, when we're, we're, we're talking about uh, states and their role, and you know this with, with New England, the state of Maine uh, was the first state in the country to, to authorize the state itself or an entity of the state to contract for pipeline capacity. You remember that? Yep. And they're still in the process of implementation for that. So think about that. Uh, a state uh, legislative authorization for, uh, for, for committing capacity on a pipeline, not a utility, a state. And uh, you know that, I think, kind of shows the, the uh, sincere interest that uh, government has in trying to determine how they're going to meet the needs, the, the energy needs uh, of the future. Um, no question, natural gas is a, a major and growing provider of energy for power generation, no question about that. Uh, conversions of coal plants uh, happening more and more frequent, uh, nuclear power. Um, changing from nuclear, uh, you know, the, the dependence on fuel oil in New England, uh, trying to, to make some changes from that. Uh, so as all of that is happening, uh, the additional natural gas uh, needs and, and how to, to provide uh, additional capacity for those areas. And then you look at the supply of natural gas. And I know you've covered this previously, I think, in another one of your seminars here, but uh, the, the uh, let's not understate the significance of the shale plays, particularly, uh, oh, the Bakken is important, the, but the Marcella shale, uh, and how that's changed the plumbing of our natural gas uh, transportation in the country. And typically you've had the Northeast at the end of the line all the time, and, and now it's not at the end of the line anymore, and, and we're shipping significant capacities south and west. Uh, on those systems um, and uh, the dealing with the whole export issue. Now, we have a uh, facility in Savannah, Georgia, just outside of Savannah, Georgia called Elba Island that when we purchased it as part of our El Paso acquisition several years ago was an LNG import facility. 
And you just don't put up an LNG import facility overnight. <laughs> Those are multi-billion dollar investments that are permitted and developed over a period of years. So fast forward, not 20 years later, and we're looking at um, a $2 billion investment in, in an export facility with natural gas coming from the Marcellus Shale. Who would have imagined that? Um, so that component of uh, natural gas supply and pricing and commercial operations uh, is extremely significant. So um, collectively, how do uh, pipeline companies, uh, we transport over 30% of the natural gas um, on a daily basis. So over 60% of the natural gas here to the Chicago metropolitan area. A lot of utilities are, are part of our uh, customer base. Um, so I think it's incumbent upon uh, us, and I know our, our commercial and business development, our regulatory teams all working with, with my folks and others to try to um, help what is becoming a more politically uh, charged topic, which in its essence is a very technical operation. You know, I, I attend so many industry conferences, I know you guys do as well. And I'm thinking when I'm, I'm sitting on panels or hearing folks talk, and this is obviously, by the looks of this, a very esteemed, educated group. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. I'd agree, absolutely. So they get all this, and we'll start throwing around acronyms and, and industry insider terms, and they're getting all of it. Um, and then you go speak to a chamber of commerce or a rotary club or someplace else, and they're saying, what are you talking about? So I know I'm getting dis distracted a little bit from the, your question, right. but I think it's, it is, is it is related because we're talking about any publicly regulated process. Let's not forget about the public component of it. And people are trying to better understand, but I, when I deal, and I know we all do, but, I, but my primary job is to deal with folks who don't necessarily agree with us. We need to get outside of our own echo chamber and try to understand what was wrong with Northern Pass. I mean, the siding and the folks who cited that, and I'm not saying they did anything <coughs> right or wrong. It wasn't my project. We had our own project up there that had issues. Um, but what went wrong there was it simply a matter of not a good understanding of the process from an industry perspective? Uh, because simply pointing the fingers at those that maybe not don't understand this and are saying how much is enough and keep it in the ground and all those issues, simply dismissive of that is not a good strategy from an industry perspective. We've got to better understand where that's coming from because I don't think anyone disagrees. Maybe there, there's fringes on the margins that are in any question. But the vast majority of people understand, and certainly the vast majority of responsible elected officials and regulators understand that, that energy transportation, energy security is important. Can I reframe right? that slightly? And let me just finish my thought, okay. then absolutely. You're going to agree with me, right? <laughs> sort of. So, so, but, but, but just to, to wrap that thought, and I apologize for digressing, but I think it's important um, that we take into account um, the many diverse opinions that are out there on these issues. And um, from FERC's perspective, from uh, industry perspective, from an investor perspective, uh, and make sense of this because there is a case to be made, as I mentioned earlier, um, that we, we don't want companies not to invest in infrastructure be because they're, they think the risk is too high based upon uncertainty of regulatory processes, the uncertainty brought on upon by opposition or folks who don't uh, have a full comprehension of all of the ramifications of that. That's, that's my point. If we can better, uh, from the variety of stakeholder interests in this, and there are many, everybody in this room is a stakeholder in this, um, get, get that engagement involved and the understanding to that level, I think it will make a tremendous difference in the outcome. So if I may reframe it, and from the distributed energy side of my business, I really understand better than ever that People know, they're very smart, they know that infrastructure decisions have consequences. So Northern Pass, if you build a transmission line to Quebec, you're going to need that Quebec uh, power for the next 20 or 30 years. If you build a gas pipeline, 
you're going to use that gas for the next 20 or 30 years. And there is such a growing awareness among the environmental community. But I'm also going to say in the distributed energy community that there are alternatives to these big infrastructure forms of energy transportation that a uh, very optimistic sort of vision that local distributed energy can play a much bigger role, but it won't if you keep building large transmission lines for power and for gas. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying that that awareness is there f much more than I've ever seen in my life. And John, well, and if, yeah, if I could add to that, Ed, because um, <clears throat> Falling back to my last point, where we were talking about <clears throat> whether or not you want to build these transmission lines from uh, the central part of the U.S. where the wind is and the southwest where the solar is and how technology is changing rapidly, which makes that less immediate and less perhaps uh, economically necessary because technology can now be distributed to uh, and utilized economically in areas that are um, uh, less prospective with respect to the, the availability and the intensity of those resources. B but that's also happening with respect at the distributed level, with respect to utilizing technologies at the distributed level instead of using them uh, from more centralized sources. And I think we're seeing that more and more. We're seeing battery storage, for example, the cost of that come down significantly. We're seeing um, communications and control technologies to be able to control utilization of energy and loads internally where we're, I, mean, I think Terry said it, I mean, we're seeing ultimately, you know, flat loads uh, across the country. We're not seeing growth in loads anymore, and very little projection of any, any growth whatsoever <coughs> in loads and in some places actually declining uh, usage of energy because of increasing efficiency. So I think all these things combining together are then building this tension, exactly what Ed's talking about, between, you know, do we build big, very uh, expensive, very long-term infrastructure that can provide us and deliver to us very cheap energy sources uh, for a long period of time, or are we going to be in a situation where some of that ultimately is going, some or a great portion of it, will become stranded because of these other technologies at distributed level that are becoming uh, less expensive and becoming more available uh, to people and people may opt for those because another thing I think Terry talked about is people do want control and, to, and people more and more are looking for more local control. You're looking at you know these large um, catastrophic climactic events where we're seeing hurricanes and fires and other things where, you know, despite everything that Terry and all the other utilities do, they really very little they can do to ensure resilience other than uh, having uh, uh, these sources come down to a local distributed level where people have their own control of these sources. So this is the tension that we're under right now between you know, the desire for the distributed resources, uh, the technology costs coming down, uh, the ability to better deliver it at, at those local levels versus the ability to build large infrastructure and, and deliver very uh, inexpensive uh, resources uh, to, to uh, consumers now. But w let me add one more point onto that because I think, I think we're all speaking the same language here in the sense of these talking about these big projects, but I'll reframe that a little bit on the, the mega projects. I, that's my term, mega project. But, you know, right now, when we talk about Northern Pass or Dakota Access or Keystone, these are huge projects attracting enormous amounts of attention to complicated regulatory and commercial processes. There are hundreds of projects going on right now that no one in this room has ever heard of, including those on this panel. Uh, that are equally or more significant than those projects. Uh, and I'm not talking about the thousands of maintenance and, uh, projects going on. I'm talking about small incremental projects serving critical needs, increasing capacity on lines, increasing customer bases for utilities, providing significant services. They're not attracting that attention. 
And that whole attention on those mega projects has ripple effects through the entire industry. So there are things happening out there on a day-to-day -day basis that are significantly enhancing the infrastructure, which goes back to my point of being risk averse. Those projects are moving forward. Sometimes they're FERC regulated, sometimes they're not, whether they're interstate or interstate. But they are moving forward and playing a significant role. But is that the model moving forward? Are we going to have these larger projects no. which do play an important role? Can I give you an example sure. of a very innovative project? Or two or three, Waterfront Toronto is a new urban development project. Uh, uh, it's 10 million square feet of office space and living space. And the decision that the City of Toronto has made is that that will be carbon neutral. So it will not rely on natural gas. It will not rely on electric power from the existing utility. And uh, they had a competition for who should be the master planner. And Google won, Sidewalk Labs, the company headed by uh, a University of Chicago board member um, who used to be the deputy mayor of New York. So. That, there's a, a, a lot of those kinds of greenfield developments that are going to try to show you that if you design the buildings right from the start, if you process your wastes properly, if you have the right solar and wind assets, you don't need to be plugged in to either the gas or the electric uh, network. That I tell you, it's going to work. They're going to do it. And we're going to find out that because design is so important, the master planners on the design side of this are so good now at designing buildings that use less and less energy. One more example, Cornell built uh, on the Roosevelt Island a massive building for their high-tech center, and it is energy independent. It doesn't need energy from the uh, surrounding system. So that's the revolution I think we're talking about, John, and you did a lot to bring that about. Well, and, le and let me give you another example, of maybe one of these sort of smaller projects that you're referring to that um, got changed because of, um, you know, a review of, you know, what, what were the effects and what were the, the consequences in West Oakland, an area I, I live in Berkeley, uh, in just north of Oakland. In West Oakland, uh, there's uh, actually a Jack London Square uh, there is a, a power plant there by uh, Dynergy um, that is a, a, a gas peaker that's been there for many, many years that's there primarily to support, utilized to support that local grid area uh, in the West Oakland area, and um, they're going to shut that plant down. So the alternative to shutting that plant down, and the reason they're going to shut it down is, is it's old and it's polluting and they want to take it out of the area, the alternative for PG&E, who's the uh, underlying uh, distribution transmission owner and also the utility that serves the area, would be to put a 230 kV line in up from the Oakland Hills down through Oakland down to the Jack London Square. You'd have to virtually put a 230 kV line uh, down in through, in through Oakland, which from a siting perspective would be a nightmare, or you'd have to underground it, which would, which would be a nightmare as well. So PG&E has decided that the alternative that they've uh, submitted into the, the planning authority, and the planning authority there is the California ISO, Independent System Operator, is to put in instead uh, a, a series of distributed resources, distributed generation, storage, and controls in the West Oakland area, in consumers, uh, facilities, whether it be businesses or homes, uh, and some of it potentially in substations as well in multiple areas to ultimately utilize that as support for the West Oakland grid instead of putting in the 230 kV line that would do that. So you know, these are the kinds of alternatives that people are looking at and that's actually more cost effective uh, under the PG&E plan to do than to, to, to put in that and cite that line. So before we open up for questions, I just wanted to, to wrap up the discussion with uh, each of your views on sort of what are the, the consequences of NIMBYism? Sort of in the long run, what are, what are we going to be looking at here? Because there are intended and unintended consequences. There, were, uh, there was a lot of opposition to pipelines in New England, for example, and as a result, in New England, they're <coughs> starting to import 
natural gas from Russia, which has far greater environmental consequences than if they just extended the line from, from Marcellus. So is it, you know, these sorts of unintended consequences, is it using existing rights of way smarter? Is it distributed generation and it's just all at higher costs? Sort of, if we're gonna, have substantial local opposition to all of these things in the long run, where does that lead us? Ed, if you want to start. Your scary talk about Russia won't affect us New Englanders, by God. <laughs> 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 so we import an occasional cargo of LNG from the Russians. Big deal. That, that's going to be the attitude. Uh, for me, <laughs> NIMBYism isn't a top five problem. Yeah. We design our projects so that we don't have NIMBY problems. Now, but we're not a economical utility, because so, they exist. Uh, you know, the utilities will do what they need to do for reliability. For our projects, we will find ways not to have NIMBY. Alan? It's not impossible. Right, and uh, NIMBY, too, defined not in my backyard. Um, that's, that comes down to a land issue. Yeah. And you can deal with land issues. It can be expensive and complicated and time consuming. We just built our Utopia pipeline project in Ohio without utilizing them in a domain. Um, but there's more to that. There's the next level of NIMBYism, if yeah. you will. Yeah. Um, I think there's a new acronym. Banana. Banana, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember what that stands for. Build absolutely any, build nothing. absolutely nothing, nothing anywhere near Anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that's a little more complicated because that goes beyond get off my property. Uh, right, right. That's don't build anything. That's more on the keep it in the ground piece. And I right. think that is a, a, a problematic because uh, if, if there's, I think any, you know, as I said, they're, they're, they're on each side of an issue. The, the days are gone when, when industry can build wherever they want, whenever they want, however they want, gone. Some still, there are a few left that still might believe that. Uh, also, it is con it's completely impossible to, to stop the transportation storage of energy now or keep it all on the ground. That's impossible. I don't think any, some folks may believe that. But there's a lot of middle ground, and I think that's where we need to, to, to focus on. And uh, so, a as mentioned, you know, we, we can continue to grow the infrastructure. The larger projects more difficult, but we can't continue to do it, provided we have a regulatory framework that is consistent and reliable. When states particularly are changing the regs or rules during <coughs> the game, that is uh, can potentially be fatal to projects. And you know, these are investments in infrastructure for the United States, but they're also investments <coughs> for the state. When you're building a pipeline, for example, if we're building it through whatever state, Georgia, uh, Florida, whatever, it may be for ultimately an original purpose uh, to identify the customer base uh, to guarantee enough shipping capacity on that pipe to, to, to authorize it to move forward from the commercial side. But that state is benefiting too because they're getting the enhanced infrastructure into their state. So if we expand a pipeline system going into New York, that's potentially going to even if it's providing natural gas to New York City, it's going to help upstate New York. If we get into the Berkshires, it could help Boston, potentially. Uh, so the, in, the enhancement of the infrastructure, we are hopeful that the states are going to be looking at that too, is the value that is to the state. Even if it's not immediate, the growth of this infrastructure in the state is going to be beneficial to the state long term. Well, you know, and I would agree that if, if you can explain to people what is the purpose of the infrastructure and how it may directly benefit them and benefit their community and or their state and or the country as a whole, then you can do a lot to, you know, to mitigate the, the effect of NIMBYism. And, and this other issue, the banana issue, I think is, is an important one as well because we need to have a debate in this country with respect to you know, what is our policy, but the problem is we have no energy policy in this country. We have no comprehensive national energy policy. All of the above is not a policy, it's a slogan. And, you know, it, it's a slogan that, that Obama used, it's a slogan that Trump uses, and it's a slogan, it's not a policy. So we really do need a comprehensive federal energy policy, in my opinion, 
And if we had such a federal energy policy, it would, be a long, it would go a long way to reducing risk for building infrastructure because people would have some certainty as to what we're going to be doing. And we need to decide what we want to do. I'm not saying one way or the other what it should be ultimately, but I'm saying we have to have that conversation in the country, and we ulti ultimately should craft that policy and move forward with it. Whether we have a carbon tax, whether we you know, do whatever else we need to do, you know, I certainly firmly believe we need to do as much as we can to do to, to s stop the uh, climate change that we have going on as more rapidly than any of us want to see happening. But to do that, we have to somehow put a policy in place. And if we don't put a policy in place, we can't get there. Yeah. All right, thank you. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Uh, all right, so to give everyone a chance to ask a question who wants to ask a question, uh, we're gonna have a, a rule about how long your question can be. Your first sentence should be a question, and your second <laughs> sentence should not exist. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I actually can't see back there at all. I mean, we can't see it. Oh, can't there's see a it. microphone coming around. Thanks. Okay. There are people there, yes. Why have you not said anything about President Trump's cha proposed changes to make permitting easier? Because it seems like you're saying mostly that these are state and local problems. Question. <laughs> Um, I can talk real quickly about okay. um, right. uh, the offshore wind uh, transmission development initiative that now must happen because we have three states that have said they want to have offshore wind in a really big scale will require federal agencies in addition to FERC, particularly BOEM. And uh, frankly, um, I welcome the thought that it might be a two-year and not a six-year process to get a bone permit. I think uh, two years ought to be enough to do a reasonable uh, uh, environmental survey. And um, so I'm all for it. It's a good thing. Uh, I, I guess on a broader perspective, um, let's see how the proposals, ideas, thoughts, however you want to characterize them, ultimately play out for implementation and promulgation. Uh, there's an extensive rulemaking process for implementation of a number of uh, things that I've seen proposed. Um, and the quasi-independent nature of some of the agencies that are going to be implementing some of these rules, FERC, for example. Um, and uh, so let's see where it all takes us. Um, I think the at the end of the day, as, as I said, um, you know, we've, we've, as a company, grown and, and been successful under the Obama administration. Uh, the, uh, the basic tenets of a permitting structure uh, and how we design our projects, if we can understand and know what those are and be relatively certain that those are going to stay in place for the process, um, we can build projects. Uh, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but we can get it done. Obviously, anything that makes a schedule uh, more uh, reduced, uh, but still responsible, uh, there's still going to be, there's a multitude of agencies that are part of any uh, siting process. I think we all know that. Uh, FERC is just one. There are many others that are part of the process, and you need to secure all those state, federal, and local permits before uh, construction. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be uh, the certainty of regulations that are, are critically important. And um, from uh, a policy perspective, too, you know, this really isn't about a Republican or a Democrat issue. Um, I know there's been a lot of focus on the Trump administration, but I will tell you, uh, what well, we deal ev with every state in the country, and where we've had the uh, I often ask this as a trivia question for, uh, the, for groups that I talk to, but from our experience, there's been only one state in the country that has banned the construction of pipelines. I'm talking about products pipelines. I can't do it for yes. natural gas pipelines. There's natural gas because that's the Natural Gas Act. Does anybody know what that state is? It's Georgia. <laughs> is that a surprise? Not, generally not known as a very blue state. Uh, so my point being is that, and there were a whole host of issues of why that happened, but it did happen. So let's not make assumptions necessarily about how things are going to play out simply on uh, who currently 
uh, is, is a president or a governor or, or other leadership in a particular local jurisdiction because uh, a lot of variables go into this. And if a, if a, if a government entity is interested in uh, making sure that environmental protections are in place, <laughs> making sure that uh, projects, infrastructure projects can move forward in a responsible way, um, I think that, at the end of the day, is going to be really what matters, not necessarily uh, who's in the White House. Do we have another up here? All ready to go. Sorry. And then you're next. Oh, I'll ask two questions in two sentences. Um, with the same question, actually. Um, if distributed generation is such a panacea that's going to save us all, why is China putting in high voltage DC lines all over the place? Um, and you, I would say it's perfectly fine if California and New York want to spend their money on expensive solutions, but what are you going to do about Kentucky that's 85% coal, has terrible wind, you know, bad solar, low per capita income? How is that going to work without some sort of infrastructure for distribution? I think John should answer that. <laughs> I, I, I'd be glad to answer that. I don't think I said that distributed generation is the panacea. I just said, do you have this tension between it's large infrastructure, are you going to do that, or, or, or the, the distributed systems ultimately? But, but I know a lot about the Chinese, and, and the Chinese are putting in those high voltage lines basically because you've got state grid, which is the, the big giant uh, grid uh, entity in China, and they like doing that basically. They, 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 you know, they, they, they have not yet gotten to uh, the point where, <coughs> as we have, uh, I think in this country, uh, a, a distributed resource industry ultimately, they certainly supply us with the panels and they supply us with, the, with all, the, all the technologies, but uh, with respect to themselves, they, they still haven't, ha haven't got to that point with uh, respect to distributing um, uh, at least electricity on a distributed level. Although interestingly enough, if you, if you ride through the countryside in China, almost every house has a solar water heater on it. Every, practically every house has a solar water heater on it. It's amazing. But um, so, you know, the, the HVDC lines, yes, I'm, I'm aware they're putting them all over China. I think it, it, it potentially is going to be a huge problem for them ultimately. Uh, and it may be uh, some very expensive stranded investment ultimately. Uh, but with respect to, I think you were talking about Kentucky. I mean, Well, it's not a matter of a luxury. It's, it's a matter of what's the cheapest, most efficient thing to do. So that's New what. York New York isn't doing the cheapest. Uh, that's true. That's probably a political decision. But, but um, ulti ultimately, they are doing uh, cheap things with respect to distributed generation in in uh, in New York through the rev process and what they've been doing there. <coughs> but uh, in Kentucky. Uh, you know, right now, I think there's a bill in the legislature to, in essence, stop rooftop solar, which is, you know, wh why stop consumers from having a choice, ultimately? Uh, and there's significant amounts of solar in Kentucky, ultimately. Uh, so, you know, uh, those things can be cost effective, but, you know, what I advocate for ultimately is doing the most efficient, cost effective things first. There's one over here. I, uh, thank you. Uh, I do have a question, but I, I also want to add two entries to the uh, NIMBY banana uh, glossary. There's uh, note, N-O-T-E, not over there either, <laughs> and cave, certain citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> uh, my question, though, it was just touched on, and I heard the phrase earlier about stranded costs. Can you talk about uh, the impact as technologies improve in terms of distribution and other aspects of, of energy? Uh, technology, what impact uh, stranded costs will have on uh, impacting the, the advancements in that regard? Stranded costs are uh, uh, a, another scary word. Um, I, I, for me, one of the genius things about the United States economy is that we're willing to blow up industries once in a while, uh, like we did with the telecom industry. And so, uh, I think that the revolution that is taking place at the distributed energy level is so profound and so strong that there are going to be a lot of stranded assets. And John, the 
stranded assets all over the place in the 90s, right. uh, we have bankruptcy laws to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing stranded assets now with respect to, uh, you know, a number of the, of the new nuke systems that, uh, the one in South Carolina that just ultimately, you know, example. went belly up. I'm, I'm waiting for the two Volga ones in, in Georgia <laughs> and what they're going to do with those as well. Um, ultimately, because you look at those two uh, Georgia plants and their bus bar cost is about 11 cents. I mean, why is anybody paying 11 cents for power in Georgia? I mean, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So yeah, we do have to worry about stranded costs. And ultimately, though, depending upon the regulatory structure uh, in Georgia, ultimately, the and, and, and probably in South Carolina to some extent as well, uh, it's the consumers, the rate payers, uh, we're going to be on the hook for that, and so that's going to, uh, you know, slow down those consumers' ability to make alternative investments in whatever distributed generation or, or wind from Oklahoma or, you know, wh whatever it may be. But because they're going to have to pay off those stranded costs, uh, it's going to have an impact economically. This is another example of the Canadians' pursuit of large-scale hydro, hydro. Yep. site C in British Columbia, for example. I think the bus bar cost there is now getting to 13 or 14 cents. Muskrat Falls up in Labrador. These mega projects are expensive and the costs are out of control. They do not have a form of protection in Canada for the ratepayer there. So the utility, the provincial utility calls the government and says, send me some money. Because that's the only way that they can disintermediate that problem. I like our system better. One more. Oh. So uh, could you talk about how the MLP corporate structure could help power generation and power distribution? There's the MLP Parity Act that's stalled and how that could play, play out. This is Mr. <laughs> LMP, so I as so. the gas guy. <laughs> Um, well, I think if you, you followed our, our company, uh, we've moved away from the MLP um, in, in the last few years. So um, uh, th there are advantages to it. I think the, the uh, you know, we'll see how the, if, if it, at all the tax uh, changes are, are playing a role in that. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we made the decision to do what we're doing. Other companies have, have not. Um, I, I think there, there is value, but it's going to come down an individual corporate decision, really. Uh, we just found it in our best interest to move to the, um, the, the business model that we have now. Okay, last question over here. It sounds like this authority of FERC that differs between natural gas and transmission lines is really important. Uh, so I was going to ask if there's any prospect for FERC to gain control over transmission lines. Uh, Oh. Uh, <laughs> this man has done his homework. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there, there, there is, there are provisions in the 2005 Energy Policy Act, and and I think even um, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, they didn't get struck down per se, but they, but what happened was the court said that ultimately the plans that the DOE made under those 2005 provisions were not done properly. And I still think there are provisions there where the Secretary of Energy, in concert with FERC, could actually take control. And I actually went to Chu, to Secretary Chu, and we talked about this, and, you know, we decided... Um, and, and my legal people at FERC decided that legally you could do it, but politically the firestorm you'd get from the states would be huge. So um, it's unlikely that I think FERC and or DOE would exercise that authority without Congress changing the law to actually give FERC uh, that uh, added authority oversighting of uh, transmission lines. And, and There's one example, like, John, in uh, Arkansas. Right. DOE went... Well, they actually did it in Arkansas? They actually did it in Arkansas, okay. and I think they are winning the legal 
battle, okay. but too late to save right. the project. So they were able to do it for rest. one state because they were battling against one state, but to try to do it in a region where you had multiple states, it would, politically it would be too yeah. big a lift. Yeah, it, it's, it's a huge political issue. Great. All right, I think we're about out of time. If you would all help join me uh, thank our panel. Thank you. Thank you.